Have I ever told you about the story about a wonderful giraffe and her lovely family? This giraffe had it all and liked to read poems. One day, Nellie recited a poem about cell division. It went something like this. Every day your cells divide, they grow, they stretch, and multiply. It can occur in hours or in days, but the first stage is always interphase. Though you may be unaware, in this stage, DNA is copied everywhere. When division is prepared, the DNA is shared. That completes this stage. It was a pretty wicked poem, and it leads us to our topic for today. Remember in the last video we talked about the origin of cells, like cells give rise to other cells, Louis Pasteur, and all those ties to the cell theory. Well, we've reached the point we need to know how it, this exactly occurred. Our final subject in topic 1 is 1.6 all about cell division. The essential idea here is that cell division is essential, but must be controlled. So let's dive right in. You probably learned about cell division back in your middle school days during life science. Maybe you remember the stages of the cell cycle. Hopefully so, but anyway, let's discuss. The cell cycle consists of two stages, interphase and the M phase. We are going to talk about these phases in depth. Interphase has three typical stages, G1, S, and G2. Sometimes the fourth stage, called G0, comes into play. The G1 phase is the first intermediate gap phase in which the cell grows and prepares for DNA replication. The S phase is the synthesis phase in which DNA is replicated. Lastly, the G2 phase, or second intermediate gap stage in which the cell finishes growing and prepares for cell division. The M phase consists of mitosis and cytokinesis. Mitosis is responsible for DNA separation into two nuclei and cytokinesis which results in two identical daughter cells. I mean, really, the whole part of mitosis is to create two daughter cells with identical genetic material. Why does this happen, you ask? Well, our cells are constantly undergoing this process out of need. Things like repairing damaged or old tissue, growth of an organism, replacing cells that die naturally during embryonic development, and asexual reproduction. You can see the cell cycle on the bottom right corner and how much of the cell cycle is spent in the different stages and phases. We're going to break these down more and talk about some issues related to the cell cycle getting out of whack. Let's talk first about interphase. Interphase specifically consists of the parts of the cell cycle that do not involve cell division. Cells spend the majority of their time in this phase, which you can see in the graphic to the right. During interphase, you can see the middle part of the slide, many of the key processes that occur. I'm not going to read them here, but they're probably good to jot down. What I do want to talk about, though, is the phases of interphase. First, we have the G1 phase. Here, organelles get produced, the proteins get synthesized, and the overall size of the cell is increasing, including the cytoplasm. When the S phase rolls around, the DNA gets replicated. You can imagine that DNA replication is pretty important, and the cell needs to make an identical copy. In the G2 phase, the cell is still growing, Organelles are being produced, and proteins continue getting synthesized. The oddball phase here is the G0 phase, which does not mean nothing is happening. It just means the cell is going about its business and processes continue, but no processes related to dividing or preparing to divide. So that is interphase. In the M phase, we first have mitosis. Mitosis consists of four specific stages. Each should be fairly easy to spot in a micrograph. You can see the diagram at the bottom has all four stages. They are prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Let's talk about prophase and metaphase first, then move on. Remember that mitosis occurs in the nucleus. So the cell has other things going on, but the nucleus is undergoing this process because the whole point is to get two separate copies of the DNA. So in prophase, DNA coils up super tightly and the chromosomes condense to the point where they become visible under a microscope. Chromosomes are comprised of genetically identical sister chromatids, which are joined at a centromere. I'll talk more about this in a few slides. Then, the paired centromeres move to opposite poles of the cell and form microtubule spindle fibers. Additionally, the nuclear membrane breaks down and the nucleus dissolves. That's prophase. It's pretty much like the nucleus is trying to get itself organized for the rest of the process. In metaphase, you can see that there is more organization. The microtubule spindle fibers from both centromeres connect to the centromere of each chromosome, and the spindle fibers shorten in length and contract. This causes chromosomes to align along the center of the cell, which is called the equatorial plane, or the metaphase plate. In anaphase, continued contraction of the spindle fibers causes genetically identical sister chromatids to separate. Once the chromatids separate, they are each considered an individual chromosome on their own right. The genetically identical chromosomes move to opposite poles of the cell. You can see the spindle fibers in white looking like they're reeling in the chromosomes back to the poles. Lastly, 
we have telophase. As the spindle fibers finish reeling in the chromosomes and the two chromosome sets arrive at the poles, spindle fibers dissolve. The chromosomes decondense and are no longer visible under a light microscope. The nuclear membranes reform around each chromosome set, creating two identical nuclei. Cytokinesis occurs concurrently, splitting the cell into two. Before we talk about cytokinesis, we should discuss a bit deeper about the chromatids and chromosomes and get a few terms straight. As we mentioned, chromosomes supercoil and condense during mitosis. They are able to be seen in a micrograph. However, supercoiled chromosomes are not typically how DNA is. Remember that the cell is typically an interphase and needs to make proteins. Well, in order for this to occur, the DNA needs to be transcribed, and it must be easy to access. So DNA that's loosely packed in the nucleus is called chromatin and easily accessed. During mitosis, the supercoiling occurs, and chromosomes are condensed and tightly wound chromatin. Don't get confused by these terms. The whole reason for this madness is just like moving from one place to another, things need to get tightly packed or else you are bound to leave something or have a hard time moving. Simply stated, DNA can easily move to the poles of the nucleus during anaphase and telophase. The other terms to get straight here are sister chromatids and centromeres. Sister chromatids are two identical copies of the same chromosome that are connected in the middle by a centromere. When they disconnect, in anaphase, they officially become daughter chromosomes. You can see the micrograph at the bottom where the DNA can be tightly packed and coiled. The last part of the cell cycle is cytokinesis. If mitosis results in two identical nuclei, then cytokinesis results in two identical daughter cells, with the cytoplasm and organelles being evenly split. While it's not difficult how it works, it works slightly differently in animal cells and plant cells. In animal cells, after anaphase, microtubule filaments form a contractile ring. This pulls the cell membrane, creating what's called a cleavage furrow, which you should remember that term from option A, neurobiology. This continues to pinch until both sides touch and two cells are formed. In plant cells, after anaphase, carbohydrate-rich vesicles form a row in the center. These vesicles fuse their little membranes together and the early cell plate forms. This cell plate extends outward and fuses with the cell wall, dividing it into two daughter cells. It's not super complicated, but just two different ways. Plants have to deal with the cell wall, while animal cells do not. Two really important skills that you want to be refining in this topic is the ability to observe cells that are undergoing mitosis and be able to identify which stage of the cell cycle they are in. You can see the example that is at the bottom. You might imagine that generally speaking, a specific organism has the majority of cells in interphase, as it's the largest phase time-wise. But, depending on the part of the organism, there may be more mitosis occurring. Something like roots and plants undergo a lot of cell division and have quicker cell cycles. So by being able to identify the stage of a cell cycle, you can calculate what is known as the mitotic index. This is the ratio between the number of cells in mitosis and the total number of cells, and is determined by analyzing micrographs and counting cells in mitosis relative to the total number of cells. You can see the math equation here. The calculation is easy peasy, you just need to train your eyes to recognize recognize the mitosis. Is the mitotic index useful, or do scientists like to spend their Friday nights getting crazy with the mitotic index? Well, if you guess that it is useful, you've won! This is a measure of the proliferation of cells, so scientists can learn how fast cell cycles are, which parts of the organism grow and develop the fastest. In humans, the mitotic index can be an important prognostic tool for predicting the response of cancer cells to chemotherapy. You will be practicing this skill in class and learning more about it. Another important thing to know is that the cell cycle is controlled by a number of regulatory proteins called cyclins. The cell cycle must be controlled so that cells are only dividing when necessary, not constantly. Cells also need to time the progression through the cell cycle so that it moves from one phase to the next only when all the steps are complete. So there are checkpoints that occur in the cell cycle to ensure it's going according to plan. You can see in the image to the bottom left that for each specific stage of the cell cycle, there are different cyclins, and those cyclins activate the cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs. You can see in the bottom right image that cyclin levels rise and CDK activity picks up as well. So naturally, the cell cycle is highly regulated, and there are cyclins that help with this, and there's also DNA that helps with this. When the cell cycle gets out of whack, there's a potential for negative things to happen. Typically, 
Cells are programmed to die in a process called apoptosis. This ensures that healthy new cells are created and those old cells are no longer used and they are recycled and scrapped. However, sometimes cells have errors and do not undergo this programmed cell death and continue going through the cell cycle, sometimes even faster than normal. Eventually, there's a mass of cells that grow, and this can form a growth called a tumor. Sometimes a tumor stays in the same spot and cells are not moving. This is called benign. If a tumor grows and some of the cells have the ability to invade other tissues, it's called malignant. Typically, when an organism has a malignant tumor, we call that cancer. Naturally, the fear is that the malignant tumor will metastasize and invade other healthy parts of the organism. This is not good at all and can cause a primary tumor to then create a secondary tumor. An example of this would be if breast cancer spread to the liver. The patient has secondary breast cancer of the liver. The cancer would be treated with breast cancer drugs. Some types of cancers are more aggressive than others, meaning they are more likely to metastasize. You can see this process in the image below of how a primary malignant tumor can give rise to a secondary tumor. So how does the cell cycle get out of whack? Well, typically there's a change in the DNA of the cell, but specifically DNA and genes that regulate the cell cycle. The biggest cause of this is a mutagen, which is an agent that changes the genetic material of an organism. This change is called a mutation. Mutagens can be physical, chemical, or biological in origin. And you can see some examples here. Mutagens that lead to the formation of cancer are further classified as carcinogens. And scientists who study the effects of chemicals have enough data to support these classifications. There is a type of gene called an oncogene that has the potential to cause cancer. Within this gene, there are two types. One type is proto-oncogenes, which code for proteins that stimulate the cell cycle and promote cell growth and proliferation. The other is a tumor suppressor gene, which codes for proteins that repress cell cycle progression and promote apoptosis, which is the programmed cell death. When a proto-oncogene is mutated or subjected to increased expression, it becomes a cancer-causing oncogene, as it can move the cell through the cell cycle when it shouldn't. Similarly, tumor suppressor genes are sometimes referred to as anti-oncogenes, as their normal function prevents cancer. If these are mutated, it can cause the cell to divide when it shouldn't. Both can lead to cancer when these changes to DNA accumulate. So these are how changes to genetic code can disrupt the cell cycle and why exposing our bodies to mutagens can potentially cause us trouble down the line. One specific application of this is the example of the correlation of smoking and the incidence of cancers. As you have learned, cigarette smoke contains over 4,000 chemical compounds, over 60 of which are known to be carcinogenic. There appears to be a strong positive correlation between the frequency of smoking and the development of cancer. The risk of lung cancer is strongly correlated with smoking, with roughly 90% of lung cancers attributable to tobacco use. Smoking also increases the risk of over a dozen other cancers, including mouth, stomach, liver, pancreas, and bowel cancer. You can see the results in the graphs that show this correlation. In both of these graphs, there are positive correlations, meaning specifically that the more a person smoked, there was a higher incidence of cancer. Tobacco companies stated that other mutagens and exposure might have caused cancer, so the findings were not sound. However, they have since stated that they knew that these findings were sound and were trying to protect their businesses. So, this is a good application to see how increased exposure to carcinogens can increase the risk of developing cancer. On that downer note, we've come to the end of topic one. Hopefully you've learned yourself a lot about the origin of life, the cell theory, different types of cells and parts of cells, and how the cell cycle works and gives rise to other cells. To read the last stanza of my poem, here we go. In cytokinesis, cytoplasm is pinched and squeezed. After dividing in the middle, the cell feels at ease. Now two daughter cells have been formed. We surely hope that you have been informed. And then it begins again. Stay woke to the bio, give a thumbs up, and pound the subscribe button. Word. As always, it's really important to give credit where it's due. While the presentation script and video are solely of my own creation, many of the images and information contained in the presentation are not. So shout outs to the following. Most of the images and video clips come from IB Bio Ninja and some of the information used. Other images and info come from Biology for Life, Bionology, iBiology, and a few images here and there. Lastly, some information was gleaned from the Cambridge edition of the IB Biology text, as the intended purpose of this presentation is to provide you with yet another resource tool to enhance your learning for the IB Biology curriculum. And this should be used under a Creative Commons Attribution License. So peace out.